Good morning, Larissa. How are you? Nice to see you. Good morning, everyone. If we can uh, finish our conversations and find our way to our seats, we will get this morning service underway. It's so good to see so many smiling faces this morning. And I want to welcome you to Ascent Bible Church for another day of prayer and worship, lifting our voices and our hearts to the Lord. Today would be considered Palm Sunday, the day that Jesus entered into Jerusalem for the final week of his earthly life prior to crucifixion and resurrection. And I'm echoing. Um, it's a special day because as he entered in, the people were thinking back to the Passover. And we're going to be celebrating a Passover Seder on Friday night. What they were thinking was that when Moses brought all of the plagues on Egypt at the time of the Passover, it had been a period of 400 years of silence in which God had not really spoken to Israel during, during their captivity. And all of a sudden, God was active again in their lives. And Moses was raised up as a deliverer. Well, at the time Jesus came upon the earth, it had been 400 years from the time of the prophet Malachi. 400 years of silence where God had not really been evident in the lives of the Jewish people. And they saw Jesus as the same type of deliverer that they had seen in Moses. And they were so excited to see Jesus come into Jerusalem because Passover was about to happen. And that's when the death blow was dealt to Egypt by Moses through the Passover. And they were sure that this bondage to Rome was going to end that week. And they were so excited. And they were saying, Hosanna, which means save now. Hosanna to the son of David, who the Messiah was, was uh, prophesied to be. And they were just ready for the, the oppression of Rome to be ended by Jesus. And by the end of the week, when he didn't deliver that death blow to Rome, their Hosannas turned to crucify because of their great disappointment in the one they were sure was the Messiah because they never saw that his deliverance was going to be a spiritual one, not a physical one. But we have the benefit of Monday morning quarterbacking. We can look back and see what transpired that weekend at the Passover, at the crucifixion, the day of uh, unleavened bread in the grave and than the resurrection to new life. And so we are celebrating this week in a fashion that they never could. Let's lift our hearts to the Lord today for his goodness, for his gift, for his promises that are sure. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you've not only given us your word in the scriptures, but you've given us your word in your son, the word of God, who was there at the beginning. We thank you for the gift that he brings to us, the gift of new life, the promise of eternal life, 
the ability to overcome this world and its challenges and its curses. That we, Lord, because of what you have done, we can live with joy in the midst of sorrow, hope in the midst of futility, and love in the midst of the wickedness that surrounds us. And so today we lift up our hearts, our hands, and our voices to you and say, Hosanna to the Son of David. Glory to God Most High. And it's in Jesus' name we always pray. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Ascent Bible Church. Glad you're here today. Uh, feel free to praise God in any way that you see fit. We're going to open our service with a song uh, called Shout to the Lord. That is uh, not the, quite the same lyrics as maybe they used during that. It, it, technically, the first praise service that ever happened for the followers of Jesus was that Palm Sunday, right? Um, and of course, the people that didn't realize uh, who Jesus was, they said, you need to stop that. You need to, you need to quiet your voices. That's, that's unbecoming. That's incorrect, inappropriate. And Jesus' response was that even if they were to be quiet, the rocks would cry out. So today, we recognize who he is as Savior, God Almighty. We recognize what he's done in our lives. Um, we were created to praise him. So we choose to do that today.
Sing that. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the
God, because of you, we get to shout out your praise, Lord God. We're so thankful for you, Jesus, because of what you did for us on that cross. Because you resurrected, Lord God, we don't get to worry about fear. We don't get to worry about doubt or anxiety anymore, Lord God. We're no longer slaves, Lord God, and we're no longer slaves to fear, Jesus. We're so grateful for you, Lord. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with the song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no
child of God. God, your love for us is just so amazing. And we can't comprehend it, Lord. And it's just incredible how you freed us, Lord. And we don't have to be fear, fearful. We don't have to be slaves to our, our running minds, Lord God. And I just pray that um, you just break every chain, Lord God, of, of fear, of, of worry, of what's to come, God. And I just pray that in this moment that we're going to sing this song, Lord, that we are just going to experience your presence god because you're here you inhabit the praises of your people and we just we worship you lord Afflictions eclipsed by glory, and I realize just how how great your affections are for me, and oh, how He loves us so! Oh, how He loves us! How He loves us!
realize how much he loves you. He was condemned on that cross so that we could be drawn into the loving arms of his kingdom. Amen. Amen. We are his portion and he is our prize. Drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes. If grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. In heaven, meets earth like an unforeseen kiss. My heart turns violently inside of my chest. I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about What an amazing segue with those last two songs, right? Um, we ought not ever forget that we are his children, that you are his child. And as a result, um, his love is deep. It's con unconditional. It's, it's, it's crazy love that he has for you and me. And as we'll see here in the next couple of weeks as we consider this very significant event in the Bible that is often referred to as the Passover, um, we'll be uh, looking to the Holy Spirit to just reveal to us the depth and the beauty of this feast that, that we do find in the Bible. It's a Jewish feast, but what I would love for us to consider in the coming next in the coming weeks in the next two weeks in the next two Sundays today and next week um, is I pray that the Spirit of God just reveal to us uh, the depth and the significance of this event and all that it means and all that it represents even in the New Testament I don't have to tell those of you that are have been around this church for a while but with the principles of Bible study that God in the Old Testament has revealed to us through through pictures and through types uh, some profound truths, and my hope and my prayer today and next week as we consider Resurrection Sunday and what we're about to do as a church this Friday uh, when we come together and have a Seder meal together. Um, I'm so looking forward to that so that um, we could um, really take to heart what we're going to, I pray, hear from his word um, today and next week. We're going to take a small little detour from our Colossian study. I know that in the program we were supposed to start the marriage stuff today, but I didn't want to kick off the, the Easter slash resurrection a day week with um, a bunch of chaos as we call out husbands and wives in the next couple of weeks. But um, just joking. Not really. Uh, but um, 
so no, we just thought it would be an appropriate thing to just kind of just step back, take a deep breath, and really consider what this coming week is all about as a church. I'm so grateful for um, Mike Herrera, Pastor Mike Herrera's leadership in the area of prayer and praise, and we launched a little study on, Friday, on Wednesday night, Worship Wednesday, on, uh, on fasting and prayer, and how appropriate it is as we head into this coming week, and he does a follow-up on how to actually apply and how it is that we could live out and commit to some significant things in our, in our Bible that reveal to us how it is that we can apply it so that God could take us to a whole other level, whole other level in this journey, in this walk that um, we are so privileged to be a part of. So join us again this Wednesday as he concludes that little fasting prayer series and as we prepare our hearts really for what we're going to be doing on Friday evening as we gather, as we come together as a church to um, celebrate a Seder meal, a Passover meal together at 6 o'clock Friday. I think we've got a few, just a few slots left, right, Janine? And see her if you're still interested. I think we've got somewhere in the number of 120 people that have signed up. So praise God for that. Isn't that going to be cool? And we're going to set things, uh, tables up right in this room and so looking forward to that and so excited about that. And then next Sunday as a follow-up, uh, and I know I'm putting the cart before the horse because today we're going to be hanging out in the New Testament and see what Jesus did in preparing the disciples for the Passover. Um, so we're not going to spend a whole lot of time really looking at the intricate, even the theological details of the Passover. We're going to do that next week, and we're being intentional about that because next week, as you all know, is um, another day out of the year where we see people showing up to church. You know, we, we, I think I refer to them often as CEOs. Anybody know any CEOs, the Christian and Easter only people? Right? And that's okay. So when they show up next week for church, guess what? We're going to share with them the significance of the Passover and why Jesus in the New Testament was referred to by John the Baptist as the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. So be preparing in my hope and my prayer that as a church this morning that we prepare our hearts, that we prepare the way for anybody who might make their way into this room next Sunday for the first time since Christmas, perhaps, or who knows how long. Who really cares? The important thing is they're back. And we have to be prepared to minister and to just love on them and just to care for them. And a lot of those people may be lost people, people that have never received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And what an opportunity for us as a church to just love on them, to just share the love of Christ as we consider the text in the book of Exodus next week. So thrilled and so excited about that. Um, I was sharing with Pastor Mike on Wednesday night after we did our prayer, after we did our prayer and fasting teaching that he did as we were leaving the building, um, I just kind of echoed my feelings and my thoughts about Sundays generally. Um, my wife will tell you, man, I look forward to Sunday mornings and they're also um, the scariest day of the week for me. I am scared to death before I come up here each and every Sunday. And um, I, I really am, honestly. And, but I love, absolutely love Sunday mornings. And I was sharing with Pastor Mike that Sunday mornings are about you guys. It's really about the body of Christ. This is where we have the opportunity to gather each and every week. And just like a football team, we huddle up. We huddle up to get guidance and direction from the Holy Spirit so that we can walk out those doors and minister and to reach the lost. That's why that sign is over the door. Right, Diego? You are now entering. You are now entering the what? The mission field. The mission field is not in here. The mission field is in there. This is the place where we come together, where we gather to prepare, to, to, to grow, to transform to be equipped so that we could take the gospel to a lost and dying world. But there's two days out of the week, Christmas and Easter, man, where we just set aside and we just make it about the lost. 
So please, please be praying about next Sunday. And I would encourage you to invite your friends, your relatives, whoever. And um, let's just lift it up in prayer Wednesday, Friday, and even before we show up to church on Sunday to just lift up that God would have his way in the hearts of some people. We live in fearful times. And, and thank you for that song because please, church, never lose sight of the, of the truth and of the fact that if you are God's child, um, you're going to be okay. He loves you more than you will ever know. And there's nothing to fear. I was sharing with somebody that I was discipling recently that the opposite of fear is not courage. It's not bravery. You know what the opposite of fear is in the Bible? It's love. God did not give you a spirit of fear, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.7, but he gave you and me. Thank you, Paul. He gave you, he didn't give you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So profound are these truths. In 1 John 5, number 18, John contrasts the fact that perfect love, are you ready for this? Mature love, Jesus kind of love, perfect love casteth out fear. Isn't that awesome? So if we really want to consider what it means to overcome those fear and anxieties and these broken, chaotic, uncertain times that we find ourselves in, could I suggest this to you? Just fall in love with him. Just love him. Because I'll tell you this, he already loves you. And that's the cool thing about this relationship thing that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ, that you are in his eyes and his mind and his heart you are his child and he loves you more than you will ever know and we're going to see that this morning as we look at this new testament perspective of the passover as i mentioned it's really revealed to us in great detail in the book of exodus chapter number 12 12 being a significant chapter in the entire bible it's a turning point in the history of god's people just like genesis 12 was significant when god made that promise to abraham about the land and about their their role and their purpose in history and prophetically chapter 12 was a huge and massive turning point in their history as larry was mentioning during our introduction and our greeting this morning 400 years of bondage and because of the Passover in Exodus chapter 12, they finally experienced, Paul, would you stand up and show us your shirt, please? They finally experienced this. Boom. <laughs> right? Freedom. I can't tell you where the Spirit of the Lord is. There's freedom. There's liberty. And this is what he's about, and he wants to reveal so much to us about himself and the significance of these events that play out in the Bible, in our text. And that's my hope and my prayer that as we put the cart before the horse and just share some thoughts out of the New Testament about this incredible event that we refer to as the Passover. You may not even know what that means, and that's okay. That's why we're here. We're here to learn. We're here to grow. We're here for a lot to allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to us what the significance of this event is. So as I mentioned this Friday, April 15th, we're going to gather as a church and we're going to celebrate a Passover meal together. So see Janine if you're interested. I think we still have some few, a few spots open. And on the 17th, we'll unpack the text in Exodus 12. Man, there's some crazy terms and some crazy phrases that are used and that passage that reveals so much to us about why Jesus, when he shows up in the New Testament, in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 29, is John the Baptist, who was standing at the River Jordan, saw Jesus approaching him, said these words. And the next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and he saith, Behold, are you ready for this? Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. This dude, John the Baptist, he understood the significance of the Passover. 
and who Jesus was. The Apostle Paul, several years later, in writing to the Corinthians, also had a grasp and understanding of the significance of this feast. He says this in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 7 and 8, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, are you ready for this? Even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. He goes on, he says in verse 8, Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of, are you ready for this? Sincerity and truth. It's a significant event. It's a turning point in the history of the nation of Israel. It's also a significant event from a New Testament perspective in all of human history. You Wednesday night folks are very familiar with the timeline that we throw up on this screen to remind us of the fact that God does have a plan. He does have a schedule. And if you remember from considering as you look at that timeline, there's a symbol that pops out of that line, right? A big red what? A big red cross. The cross was the turning point in all of human history. The entire time, entire time as you and I was reset because of what Jesus did on that cross. So we're going to look and we're going to consider the significance of this feast, this event, both in a New and a Old Testament perspective. The Passover slash Last Supper is mentioned in all four of the Gospels. That's not always the case, where you find different events and different things playing out in the Gospels. When I refer to the Gospels, I'm referring specifically to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is where you find the, uh, the life of Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of things that play out in the various Gospels in your Bible, but the Passover slash Lord's Supper is an event that plays out in all four of them. In the three Gospels that are known as the Synoptic Gospels, the reason why they're referred to as the Synoptic Gospels is because the stories and the events in Matthew, Mark, and Luke are pretty much summarized in those chapters. And the Synoptic Gospels are, as I mentioned, those three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Here's an interesting point of information. Or in Matthew, the Passover is mentioned in 13 verses. In the Gospel of Mark, it's mentioned in 15 verses. In Luke, 17 verses. But here's what's crazy, because the Gospel of John is not one of the Synoptic Gospels. Guess how many verses describe and define what was going on during this Passover event? 155 verses in five chapters. You find the Passover slash Last Supper mentioned in chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 of the Gospel of John. You know what is so unique about John and why he's not considered one of the synoptic guys? Is because his perception and his understanding of Jesus was different than the other guys that followed him. As a matter of fact, in the Gospel of John, chapter number 13, when Jesus is gathering the 12 to have a meal with them, he reveals to them that one of you guys in this room is going to betray me. And John is the only guy that lifts his head up off of Jesus' chest and asks the question, who is it, Lord? Because he knew deep down in his heart that it won him. That's the kind of connection and relationship that John had with the Lord. The other 10 guys even watch Judas Iscariot leave the room with a bag of cash because he was the treasurer, thinking he's going to go out and do some business and go buy some bread for whatever. 
not realizing, not even understanding that he had left the room to go and betray Christ. This guy, John, had the privilege, are you ready for this? To hear the very heartbeat of God. What an honor that is, huh? This guy knew and understood Jesus for who he was. It's in the Gospel of John where you find those infamous phases. There's no genealogy in the Gospel of John. I'm not sure if you're aware of that or not. You know why that is? Because John, more than anybody else in antiquity, understood who Jesus was. And he's the one that writes the words in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in verse 14, he reveals to us, and the word was what? Made flesh and dwelt among us. Who was he talking about? Who was he writing about? Jesus. This John dude is amazing. So I'm not surprised that he would provide us five entire chapters on this event. As a matter of fact, in John chapter number 13, I want to share with you, if you want to go ahead and turn there, because we're going to glean some truths from each one of these five chapters as we unpack some thoughts. Some of the things that Jesus did, some of the things that he prepared the disciples for. And again, keep in mind, just like you and I, we don't always grasp what it is that Jesus is revealing and preparing. And there's a reason why he chose the Passover to do what he did. Historically, we'll see it and we'll consider it next week, but even during the life of Jesus at three o'clock in the afternoon on the Jewish Passover, the Jewish priests would gather to begin slaughtering the lambs. Where's Clyde? (laughs) There's Clyde. (laughs) He killed Bambi yesterday. No, I'm kidding. Was it, did you not, did Lorraine not name it Bambi? <laughs> they did a lamb yesterday. Isn't that cool? That's awesome. Preparing. What an amazing time. The Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. There's a reason why he was given that name, that title. But listen to how this whole Passover, Lord's Supper, Thing plays out. Look at verse number one with me. Now, and here's your context, even historically. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world and unto the Father, having, I love this, just in case we miss it, you can't even go one verse into the whole Passover slash Lord's Supper event without Jesus reminding us of his love for you. Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. This is how it begins. This is how the Passover story began. So this morning, as we consider our outline, this is what we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at a Passover proclamation that Jesus makes in this chapter. A powerful proclamation, a significant proclamation, a turning point proclamation. And then we're going to jump down into verse verse 14 and we're going to talk about two promises that Jesus makes to the disciples during this setting, during this time together, one last time. The guys that he just referred to there in verse 1 that he loves dearly. And then in verses 1 through 5 of chapter number 15, we're going to look at a Passover presence. This is the heart of the Passover. There's five chapters, so chapter 15 is the middle. It's the heart. And you know what this speaks to? You know what his charge to them is? Just abide in me, man. Just abide in me and let me abide in you. And you know what? Everything's going to be okay. And then in chapter 16... 
he reveals to him. After reminding them that things are going to get crazy town, that things are going to get chaotic, that you could find peace in the midst of chaos. Does that sound familiar? Does anybody in this room need to hear those words? I know I do. And then he closes with this, and this is why Wednesday nights are so special in our church. Not Wednesday nights, but worship Wednesdays, that first Wednesday of the month. You know what Jesus does? He goes into another room, I'm assuming, and he falls on his face, and he goes and he prays to the Father on behalf of his disciples. That's how much he loves them. That's how much he loves you. Where the God of the universe will intercede on our behalf. This is what we're going to experience in preparing, I pray, our hearts for this amazing event that we are going to witness Friday night and then unpack it Sunday morning next week. So what is the first thing that Jesus does in the gospel of John chapter number 13 as he commences this thing, as he's revealing to them that, man, it's Passover time. In other words, on probably, not probably being Jews, they understood the significance of that feast. And God choosing that day to prepare them for his departure, knowing and realizing what John the Baptist had said of him. As John revealed to people that were present at the River Jordan that he is the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. But what blows me away about our Lord is the very first thing that he does. He grabs a dish and he grabs a towel and he sits the 12 down, including Judas Iscariot, who just a few minutes later is going to betray him. He sits them down and what does he do? He washes their feet. That's your Jesus. That's our Jesus. This is why we can't ever lose sight of the humility and the humbleness that we as a church and even as an individuals we need to maintain as we venture out, as God uses us for his glory to minister to a lost and dying world. Because he's teaching them and he reveals them and he makes it very known as they began to question why he was even doing that. He says, dudes, you don't get this, but I'm trying to teach you something here, so pay attention. I want you to understand what it means to serve. The greatest honor, the greatest privilege that you have as a believer is the opportunity and the privilege to serve him. And if you're curious and interested about what that means, we published a little booklet back a couple months ago in January that we know that we call our vision document that reveals to you and to me opportunities on how and you what you could serve and where the body of Christ, the church, Ascent Bible Church, are privileged to be his hands and his feet in this age. And that's the first lesson. That's what he reveals to them. But I want to share with you this proclamation that he makes, and it's found in the 34th verse of chapter number 13. So take your Bibles and turn there because he says something really profound, really crazy. Are you ready for this? Look what he says. A new commandment I give unto you. In other words, what he's about to say is going to supersede anything else that you find in the Old Testament, whether it be the, the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20 to the 1,800 other commandments that you find in the book of Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. He says one commandment is going to supersede all that. And you know what it is? Are you ready for this? That you what? That you love one another. Isn't that cool about our Lord? How simple he makes things. We complicate things, right? 
Religion is all about getting you to do something to somehow earn favor with God when the God of this universe loves you and me unconditionally. And all he desires from you, and you know how that love will develop, and we'll see that when we get to chapter number 15, by learning and understanding what it means to be intimate with him. He says this in the verse, as I have loved you, here's the expectation. I expect that ye love one another. Isn't that cool? Isn't that awesome? He says, by this, by this truth and your love for one another, moving forward even 2,000 years later, this is how people will know that we are followers and lovers of Jesus. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. Not how big of a Bible you hold or how many rallies you go to or how many signs you protest against or all the other things that Christians do today. But people will know who you are in Christ by how much you love one another and you love a lost and dying world. So significant was his love for these guys that even when one of the 12, Peter specifically, just a few hours later, denied him. And I guarantee as Jesus made on, you'll see this in Matthew's account of what transpired as Jesus and, uh, and Peter made eye contact after he had heard that crow crow a third time and he had denied him three times. The Bible says that Peter wept bitterly. And you know what he did? He packed his bags and he went home. Where was home for Peter? The Galilean region. Around the Sea of Galilee. That's where he left. That's where he went. And you know what he went? He said, man, this thing's over. My life is over. These three and a half years that I spent with Jesus are gone. I don't know what to do now because of the denial. And he goes back home and he goes back doing what the only thing that he knew to do. And you know what that was? To fish. He was a fisherman. And three days later, guess who shows up at the Sea of Galilee? Jesus Christ. And he sees these seven disciples that had bailed after all the chaos and all the uncertainty after they heard about and saw him hanging on the cross. He yells out to them. He goes, hey, have any luck yet? Remember that phrase whenever you go fishing? Any luck? Some of you guys can fish really well, right, Kent Hill? No. Hey, knuckleheads, cast, he didn't say that to them. I said that. He said, throw your nets on the other side. And you know what they did? Man, they brought in a ton of fish. And at that instant, Peter realized who it was. And he says to the other dudes, I'm not sure, I'm paraphrasing now, right? Hey, it's Jesus. And the Bible says that he put a garment on because he was ashamed. He swims back to the shore. And Jesus says, come on, let's have a meal. Embarrassed, ashamed because of the denial. Peter, I'm sure, looking down, looking away from the Lord. Probably wanting to talk to him, but too ashamed to talk to him. Jesus only asks him one question. And you know what that question was? Peter, do you love me? That was it. He didn't ask him like we do to each other. Why did you deny me? Or why did you do this? Or why didn't you do that? He asked him one question, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, of course I love you. And then you know what Jesus said next? All right, dude, then feed my lambs. Peter, are you sure you love me? Second time. Yes, Lord, I love you. Why would you ask? Then feed my sheep. He asks him a third time. 
know what the Lord is all about? Reconciling. He denied him three times, and he asked them three times, do you love me? You know what he said to him? I no longer just need you to be a fisher of men or a fisherman, but now I need you to be a shepherd. Now I need you to feed some sheep. You know what we call that in church? We call it discipleship. There's so many gifted, skilled teachers and Bible folks in this room that God is calling you to invest in the life of somebody else. So I beg, it begs the question, do you love him? Because the answer is the same <laughs> for you as it was for Peter. Then feed his baby lambs. Then feed his sheep. We got a bunch of little lambs in the room next door. And I hear people say all the time, oh, the kids are our future. No, they're our present. Are you not paying attention to what this world is doing to our children today? Like right now? And how governments and educational systems are getting them to lose their innocence? They're not prepared to hear and to get what the system in the world is throwing at them. This is why you're here. And if you're a parent and if you're a child and if you love Jesus, then feed your lambs. Feed them the word of God. Get them to know Jesus. Get them to love Jesus. That's the proclamation. That's the charge. That's the challenge to these disciples here in chapter number 13. A new commandment I give you that ye love one another. The second principle, the second Passover lesson that I want us to consider this morning and this, Jesus prepares these guys for his departure and he gives them two promises. The first one is found here in John chapter number 14, verses one through three. So turn in your Bibles to chapter number 14. I'm gonna read three verses. This is packed with truth. We're not going to have the time to really look at all that is being implied or all that is revealed to us in these verses. But the Last Supper was a significant event as it relates to what Jesus says to them in these three verses. And he says this to them. Look at this. He says to them in this, in this context, in this passage together of preparing them for his departure. He says, let not your heart be troubled. If ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And here's the promise. I go to prepare a place for you. Isn't that awesome? And then listen to verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I just might, maybe, I will come again. No, man, he's coming back. He's coming again. He says, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Physically, literally, being with Jesus eternally. See, these were a bunch of Galileans. The only one of the 12 that was not a Galilean was none other than Judas Iscariot. He was from Syria. So these other 11 guys, they understood the significance of a Galilean wedding. Because in the rest of this chapter, as you look into it and you unpack all that's going on, on Jesus in chapter number 14 offers them the cup of joy. And as they partook out of that cup, it was a covenant, a new a covenant, the New Testament in his blood. It was a covenant between a groom and a wife as it relates to a Galilean wedding. So in a Galilean wedding, when that bride or that fiance would take of the cup, and if she would receive the cup and take of the cup, she was telling the potential groom in the midst and in the, in the presence of her father that she was going to accept this this arrangement, this, what do we call it when people, uh, this engagement. Now they were engaged. 
And from that point on, she would be known in the village as what? The one that was bought with the price. Isn't that cool? And you know what the groom would do next? He would pack up his stuff, and he would go back to his own village and build a house that would be attached to his father's house. And then it would be the father that would decide, would determine when that room was ready. And then he would say to his son, all right, go get your bride. And he would make his way over the hilltop. And you know what they would do in that Galilean wedding? They would blow the shofar that the groom is coming for his bride. Does that ring a bell? Does that story ring a bell? Guess who he has in mind? You, his church, his bride. If you've never seen the documentary Before the Wrath, I highly recommend it. Lays this out in great detail. Where's the promise? Listen, church, he's coming back for his bride. The church, the body of Christ, this body of believers for the last 2,000 years is what he's coming back for. Revelation chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians 4. All through the Bible, God is preparing. You see the story play out in the Song of Solomon and Solomon and the Shulamite women. All these types and all these connections that you see in the Old Testament where you had this Jewish groom and this Gentile bride. God was preparing us, preparing the world for this thing called his bride. Which you, if you know him, are privileged to be a part of. And guess what he's doing right now? You have any clue? He's preparing a place for you. He's preparing a place for me. There's another promise that Jesus makes to the disciples in this chapter. It's found down in verse number 16. Look with me there in verse 16. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. This is perhaps the greatest chapter, chapter number 14. Are you ready for this? On the Holy Spirit of God. And you know what this, you know what Jesus refers to his spirit? As the what? As the comforter. As one who comforts. If you know Jesus Christ today is your Savior, guess where he lives right now? Anybody have any clue? He lives inside of you. There's nothing, nothing to fear. What are we afraid of? The promise that he made to the disciples as he prepared, as he was equipping them to go out into the world in the Great Commission, he says, Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then he says this, And I have commanded you, he says, And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. How many of us really believe that? How many of us really believe that? Guess what? He's with you. He's with you right now. He lives inside you. Don't ask me to explain how Jesus could be in heaven right now building a house and at the same level inside of you. You know what? He's God. He could do whatever he wants. One of these days, we'll see him in all his glory. You'll have your glorified body and you'll get it. Oh, that's how the Trinity is. It works. I get it now. But until then... We walk by faith and not by sight. I believe it, man. And I believe he's coming back. I believe in a literal rapture. I believe in a little second coming. I believe in a literal millennial reign where Jesus will rule in Jerusalem for a thousand years. And you're seeing the stage set like never before right now as we speak. Man, we live in exciting times. Chaotic, uncertain, fearful at times. But don't forget that Jesus promised you and he promised me what? A comforter. He's called the Holy Spirit. Listen to verse 19. I'm sorry, verse number 17. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him for what? He dwelleth with you and shall be, are you ready for this? Shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Anybody know when that actually occurred? 
when the Holy Spirit indwelled them? It was right after the resurrection. And Jesus meets up with the disciples in that upper room. And that whole story thing playing out with Thomas. And the Bible says that he breathed into them. And they received the Holy Ghost. From that point on, man, it was no holes barred. He was ready to birth this thing called the church. And he was ready to make your and my body a temple of the Holy Ghost. Go figure. We were looking at this truth in Colossians a few months ago. In Colossians 1.23, ask me to explain or try to understand the fact that God lives inside of me. Mind-blowing. Of all the truths in the Bible, to me, that's the most bizarre and the most mind-blowing of all. That he's living inside of us. The God of this universe is living in each one of you right now today. Go figure. You know what? I do believe it. I believe it as sure as I'm I'm standing here because he, in this chapter, reveals to us that it's the Spirit of God that's going to lead us into what? All truth. He's the Spirit of truth. So as you start to spend time in his word, as you start to fall in love with him, he starts to connect dots for you. He starts to reveal to you all the craziness and all the stuff that's going on in the planet. Why? To prepare you so that we could be ready for his return. It's like, wake up, church. We are living in the most exciting time in the history of mankind, man. We get to see the return of the king. And this is what he's driving home. And then the third principle, the third point here, the third prep truth that God wants to do in the life of these guys is teach them about the presence of God. This chapter, chapter number 15, is the chapter that is the heart of this entire event. It says this in verse 1, Jesus revealing to the disciples the significance of this connection that he desires with us. He says to them, he says, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, fruit he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. What a profound truth that is. Any, besides my brother Clyde, any farmers in the room? Any people that understand agriculture or horticulture just a little bit? I've got these really cool four apricot trees in my front yard. And you know, one of the things that I do every summer moving into the fall is I start looking for dead branches. And you know what I do with those dead branches? I purge them. I take a saw. Or actually, I have Abel climb the tree and take a saw (laughs) and cut those branches down. And I'll say, all right, see that branch there? Or see that branch there? Dead branches, dead things in our lives that we need a purge so that God could bear fruit. This is what he's driving home with these guys. And you know what happens if you go, if you go to Israel today and you, and you actually sit in a, in a, in a, within the midst of a vineyard? Those dead branches are used to build a hedge around the vine. Isn't that cool? That's where we get the phrase in church about a hedge of protection, or building a hedge. And sometimes we have to protect ourselves from ourselves, do we not? Protect, protecting the vine. Jesus says of the Father that God, the Father, is the husbandman. It's his vine. It's his vineyard. But he's the branch, and we will bear fruit in our lives when we're intimate with him. He says this in verse number three. Now ye are clean through the world, which I now ye are clean through the world, which I through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. And then listen to how the passage closes. For without me, for without me, what? 
you can do nothing. Man, isn't that a huge load off your shoulders? Isn't it cool to know that you don't have to bury and carry the burden? You just have to latch on to Jesus. You just have to abide in him. He's that branch. It's through that branch. It's through that vine where we get nutrition, where we get water, where we get everything that we need to get to live. This is what we were driving home last week when we handed out this little handout to you, The Simple Life. These five points about what it means to talk to God. You know what we were encouraging you to do? Simply, with those five points, to abide. Simply abide. Abiding in Him. It's a tough lesson. It's a hard thing. And I think I mentioned it last week. It may be simple, but man, it's tough, isn't it? Why? Because it requires something of me. It requires discipline. In fact, God had to teach Moses, this great leader that we're going to read about next week, he struggled with this because he was always wanting to get ahead of God and hang on to the things that God was having him let go of. There's a great passage in the book of Exodus chapter number 24. I believe it's like verse 12. When God was going to reveal to Moses, and he, yeah, here it is. It says, and the Lord said unto Moses, and this is God who's preparing him to, to give him the Ten Commandments and also to reveal to him the structure of this dwelling place, this, this tabernacle, which was an Old Testament picture of your body and my body in the New Testament. He says this to him, and the Lord said unto Moses, come up to the mount and what? And just be there. Moses, just be there. No expectations. You don't need to you don't need to do this and do that and come into the church and clean and 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 take the garbage and do all the stuff that we do in church. He says, "You know what, dude? I just need you to just be there." Would you just be there? And if you read the rest of the passage, if you read the rest of the chapter, for 6 days God doesn't say a word. You know what he was teaching this dude? Would you just be still? Would you just slow down so I can speak? Just be there. Be still, the psalmist says in 4610. Be still. In other words, shh. shh, shh. You don't need your alarm blaring like a horn. You don't need to turn the TV on first thing in the morning and waiting for the news and get puked on all over the place before you even get your day going. You know what we just need to do? You know what we just need to learn? To just be there. And you know what he'll do? When he chooses to do so, he'll begin to speak. And when he speaks, man, he's going to take you to a whole other level. He's going to reveal stuff to you that you never, ever imagined. But it's incumbent on me when he invites me, he says, John, would you just come up here and just shut your trap, slow your mind down, and just be there. Be there. The simple life. But man, it's hard. It begins by seek, by talking to God, as we saw last week, about the purpose of life. Seeking the things above, setting your affection on him talking to God daily about the passions of the flesh, talking to God daily about the perils of self by just being there. The Passover presence. See how this guy, these guys were getting prepared by the Lord. He was getting ready to leave them, even unbeknownst to them to some degree. the importance and the significance of preparation. And the next, and the fourth point in our little study here this morning is a Passover peace. Jesus prepares them for his departure in this 16th chapter. This is the last chapter before he goes on and just hangs out with the Father on our behalf. 
And in John chapter 16, verse 16, you find these words. In a little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, in a little while, and ye shall not see me, because I go to the Father. Imagine being with them and seeing all these miracles and all these great things in, in all that Jesus did in the Gospels and then knowing and realizing that he was not going to be there anymore. Could you imagine the fear, the anxiety, the uncertainty that these guys were experiencing? And then he says this to them in that same chapter in verse number 20, just four verses later, he says this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. The world's going to be happy when they see me hanging on that cross because in the world and in the devil's eyes, they've won. But your sorrow, <laughs> are you ready for this, folks? But your sorrow shall be turned into joy. You know when that happened? You know when it was realized? Three days later on the third day, on Resurrection Sunday. Goes on, he says this to them. He says, a woman when she is in travail hath sorrow because her hour is come. And I was privileged to be with my wife when both our kids were born. And wow, I remember just shaking my head. How can she even do this? Better you than me. I said what I said to Larry while she was suffering. <laughs> I am such a jerk. I know you guys think that about me, but that's okay. <laughs> she knows that, and I know that. But man, when those children were born, we got the whole little Jack yesterday, and hear the cooing, and it's so sweet. It is so sweet. Check this out. These things, I'm sorry. A woman, when she's in travail, has sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man, my mom said this when I was born, is born into the world. <laughs> I love my mama. Man, I love my mama. Isn't that cool how God just made this whole thing about relationships how that part of the story never changes that's what this is about man it's really that simple don't complicate it the only thing as we've already heard a number of times and as we've learned the only thing he wants from you is you to just be there and what's so cool is if you study the life of Moses a few chapters later in the 33rd chapter, I believe it's verse 11, the Bible says that that relationship went to a whole new level because they spoke to each other. Are you ready for this? Face to face. Isn't that cool? And then if you go to the book of Numbers, and I'm not sure where it is, but I'm sure Jay will find it. The Bible says that Moses had a relationship and a connection with a man. Are you ready for this one? Mouth to mouth. You know what that says to me? Inspiration where God breathed life into that man just like he did Adam. That's what he did with the disciples in John chapter 20. When he finally put the Holy Spirit of God in them, the Bible says that he breathed into them and he desires to breathe life into you and to me. So they're blown away. They're confused. They're wondering how they're ever going to find peace in crazy town because their life is going to change radically. Just one chapter over in chapter number 18 when he's arrested and in chapter 19 finally crucified and then the world is rocked at his resurrection. But listen closely to how this 16th chapter closes. This is so amazing. This is so incredible. Please, church, embrace these verses. These verses. Never lose sight of this truth. 
wherever it is that you find yourself in whatever uncertain times and fearful times in your lives, memorize these verses. Hold on to these truths. He says to them in verse number 32, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered every man to his own, and shall leave me alone, and I am not alone, because the Father is with me. And then he says this to them in verse 33. You ready for this? This is so cool. This is so profound. He says these things. What things is he referring to? Everything that he said in chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16. He says these things have I spoken unto you that in me ye might have. Are you ready for this? You might have what? You might have peace. Remember we defined the word peace a couple of weeks ago. The Hebrew word for peace is the word shalom, which simply means in Hebrew, destroy the authority attached to chaos. Did you hear that? Are your lives chaotic right now? Guess what? You've embraced the chaos in your life and you have no peace. But he promises these guys peace. The very last words, this verse, 33, is the very last thing that he says to these guys. These things I have spoken unto you that in ye might have peace. For in the world ye shall have tribulation. Not maybe, not might, you will have it. Some of you have already experienced this. You know what this verse, this is real to you. Ye shall have tribulation. And then he says this, I love this. But be of good cheer. Why? Jesus says to you and to me, for I have overcome the world. We need to fight from a position of victory, not for victory. You are already victors. Quit playing the victim. Know who you are in Christ. You are a child of the king, we sang. There's no fear in that. He loves you more than you'll ever know. Perfect love casteth out fear. God did not give you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. It's all in this book. These truths are there to remind us of who we are in Jesus Christ each and every day so that we could be prepared for when... Our Passover is finally revealed. And then the last thing that Jesus does is found in the 17th chapter in the Gospel of John. And as I mentioned earlier, imagine the God of the universe. Imagine the God of the universe interceding on your and my behalf. That's exactly what he does. The power of prayer. This is why Wednesday night worship prayer is so important. We're doing a series. Mike is doing a series right now on fasting. And some of you I know are already doing that and have shared with me how God is already speaking and revealing to you what a powerful thing that is. And Jesus says this, in his prayer, listen to his words beginning here in verse number 13. And I'm going to close with this. And now, the, now come I to thee, speaking to the Father, and these things I speak in the world that they, the disciples, his followers, might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them, I love this, I have given them thy word. Question is, what are you going to do with it? I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. You should embrace that truth, because it's a reality, it's truth. Quit trying to suck up to this world. It hates you, despises you. By the way, your kingdom is not of this world. Isn't that a glorious thing to consider, right? So why do we live and why do we want to just latch on to anything and everything here? We're going to look at that next week when we consider what God did in the life of the Jews, of the nation of Israel in the book of Exodus. Why is it called Exodus? Because he finally got his people out of the world. After 400 stinking years of bondage. Man, aren't you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Aren't you just tired of serving this world, this Pharaoh who is a type of Antichrist, who does nothing, desires more, nothing more than to oppress? Well, guess what the turning point was? Exodus 12. 
the shed blood of the Lamb. Verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from evil. There you go, guys. This is what church is about, to equip us, to learn to put his armor on so that we could go out into this world and do what he's called us to do. We're not some cult that's going to move out to Pekoslovakia somewhere <laughs> and shelter down and build shelters and bomb things or whatever Christians are doing today. No, man, you are the salt and the what? The light of this world. You're the only Jesus this world will ever see. Get in the world. Don't be a part of the world, but get in there and know that that world is your mission field. It is our field. It says this in verse number 16. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And then he says this in verse 17. Are you ready for this? I love this verse. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible, and I have like 5,000 favorite verses, but this is one of them for sure. <laughs> Look what he says. Father, Father, sanctify them. Set them apart for this mission. Sanctify them with thy truth. Thy word is truth. You have everything you need right here to find your purpose and your mission in this journey called life. And then he says in verse 18, And thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. He's talking about you. He's talking about me. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but that for them which also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Are you getting the gist? So simple, huh? Verse 22 says, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. In the words of one of my heroes, Nacho, <laughs> don't you want a little taste of the glory? <laughs> it's there for the taking. Verse 22, check this out. And the glory which thou givest me, I give in them that they may be one, even as what? Even as we are one. This is how they'll know who we are in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for you, Lord Jesus. And I pray, Lord, this we press on and look to you, Lord, as our Passover as the Passover lamb, Lord Jesus, that we never, ever, ever lose sight of your glory, of your purpose for our lives. Lord, we didn't see it in verse number 8 of chapter 15, but Lord, your word says in verse 8 that you are glorified, that you are glorified, Lord Jesus, in our lives when we bear much fruit. And Lord, I pray that we would understand and know your purpose and your mission for our lives. Lord, we ask these things in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Amen.
getting dangerously close to yodeling there. But I want to welcome you to Ascent Bible Church and say that if uh, this is your first time here, you should have received a gift bag when you came in. If you didn't, please raise your hand. We'll get one to you now. Inside there are several things, including two important cards, one blue, one pink. The blue one is to give us information that tells us you were here and allows us to contact you if you'd like to be contacted for follow-up. The pink one is for you and everybody else in the congregation who has a prayer request. Fill it out. We love to pray. Put both cards in the offering box in the center of the sanctuary. John mentioned during his sermon a handout called The Simple Life that he gave last week. We put that up on the website, ascentbible.church. Go to the printable resources page, and you can pull one up and print one for yourself if you'd like. Next slide. Okay. Don't want to carry this too far. John mentioned this several times. Please join us on Wednesday night for part two of prayer and fasting. We had a great, great session last Wednesday, and if you missed it, you're really missing out on drawing closer to God and closer to each other. So please join us Wednesday night at 7. Principles of Bible study then will uh, continue the following Wednesday on the 20th. And I don't know which principle John's going to cover, but he's covering one of them. Passover Seder, like John said, there's still room on the sign-up sheet. Two additional announcements relative to this. I believe some ladies had told Janine that they were interested in cooking. So if that's you, please meet with her. Janine, raise your hand, please. Meet with her after the service, and she'll coordinate that aspect. Also, each of the tables that will be throughout this sanctuary will have a Papa designated who represents the father in the Jewish family. And he presides over the Seder ceremony we are having training, a brief training session after church today for those of you who either know you're already assigned to be papas. We also have, I think, three or four tables that don't have one assigned yet. So if you're interested in being a papa at one of the tables, please meet with us right after service today up front here, and we'll go through the ceremony real quick for you so you know what you're doing. Next. Next. Sunday is Resurrection Sunday, and John will have that covered. So bring people who need to hear the gospel and relate it to what went on back in Exodus. We're starting a green thumb ministry. So if you have a green thumb and would like to participate in the landscaping that is going to be done over the next 60 days in the back here. Yeah, just hold on. Hold on. I got it covered. I know that I didn't have it covered last week, and you are justified in calling me to attention. <laughs> but <laughs> there is a sign-up sheet in the lobby to sign up to be part of it. See either Mr. Van or Miss Christy. Christy, raise your hand. If you're interested in getting involved in that, we are going to be planting flowers and plants and we're also going to be having a little vegetable garden in the far back. We're collecting things for compost. So along with the sign-up sheet in the lobby, there is a handout that you can take that tells you the things that contribute to compost. And you'll be very surprised at some of the things that are on there. I don't even want to go into it. OK, so sign up after church today. parents. Please pick up your precious little ones so that everybody can be part of the fellowship in the room next door. I believe that it is Shatemi Adebayo's birthday today, so Jonathan and Elizabeth have brought some special treats. So join with us next door to celebrate her birthday. Have a good time. Get to know each other, love each other, and the Lord. God bless you, and thank you for being here.